the goals that all of us want. The Americans are not ready for this. The U.S. is not ready to take advice from Turkey on how to deal with some Middle East problem. We feel that the Middle Easterners don't understand this situation. Turkey is just a small country. They're amateurs in the world. They don't see with the clarity that we see. And uh, I think this has become very, very frustrating to the Turks. I don't think the relationship between the U.S. and Turkey is uh, deeply frayed, as some people are saying in the U.S., but I do think uh, what you're seeing behind this is something that's uh, historic and long-term. It's bigger than the uh, attempt to make a deal between Iran and the U.S. It's bigger than the Gaza flotilla. It's a question of the arc of history. The Turks might be a little bit ahead of the arc. What they're saying is, we represent a phenomenon you're going to see more of in the 21st century, and that is the rise of the middle powers. This will be a century when Mexico and Brazil and Turkey and Russia and South Africa and India are becoming major players in the world. And we're going to start now. The Americans, if anything, are looking back to a past era when we ruled, and, and we're saying, no, we don't want that era to come too soon. We're going to try to maintain our power. So I think behind these conflicts and arguments between Turkey and the United States right now lies this larger conception of the emergence of a new block of countries that's going to be very important in the 21st century. It's trying to peck its way out of the shell right now, and the United States is trying to keep it in that shell as long as possible. And finally, Saudi Arabia. Why the relationship the United States has with Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia and Israel have, of course, been our traditional long-term allies in the Middle East. And there's a general belief that our relationship with Israel is based on shared values and history, and our relation with Saudi Arabia is based mainly on oil. There's some truth to both of these clichés, uh, but as you saw in my book, I devote a substantial section to talking about another reason why we became allied with those two countries during the Cold War. It was something that wasn't really clear at the time. It's only becoming more clear now. And that is that Saudi Arabia and Israel were the only two countries in the world that provided the United States with lots of covert, clandestine help for our Cold War battles uh, in a uh, in a series of uh, obscure battlegrounds. When, for example, President Reagan wanted to help uh, the Guatemalan military dictatorship in the 1980s, and he wasn't allowed to do that because the Congress had banned American aid to Guatemala, he got the Israelis to do it. When we wanted to help the Contras in Nicaragua during a period when we were not allowed to do that by law, we got the Saudis secretly to give money for it. Saudi Arabia funded uh, the Mujahideen War in Afghanistan. Uh, the Israelis were our proxies in South Africa. You see this all over the world. And, and this was really a fundamental basis of our relationship with those two countries. Now, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, I really feel that uh, we've become too suffocating a presence there. This is a country whose long-term strategic goals are very unclear and, in many cases, could conflict with ours, and whose society has absolutely nothing to do with American society. That doesn't make it a good long-term ally going forward. I think, in the Arab world in general, we've been too suffocating. We not only have a position on every dispute between Arab countries, but even disputes within Arab countries. This faction should be allowed into your government. Keep that faction out. The U.S. has traditionally been very afraid of democracy in the Arab world, which is the last place in the world that democracy has failed to arrive. And the reason is, we fear that if there is democracy in the Arab world, it will produce, ultimately, some kind of Islamic alternative. That's probably a legitimate fear. That probably is what would happen. But in the long run, that's going to emerge anyway. And the sooner the lid gets taken off, the less militant that alternative will be. History of the West shows that Christian and Western governments had to go through different periods of experimentation to figure out what was the form of government that was best for us. This is a process the Arab world's also going to have to go through. So I'd like to see the U.S. pull a little further away from Saudi Arabia and the other Arab countries and essentially let Arabia be Arabia. If this happens to have the result that Saudi Arabia makes it a little more difficult for us to get their oil, that would actually be good for us, because we need another kick to try to pull that needle out of our arm. 
You know, I thought your piece uh, that you wrote, Treat Israel Like Iran, was a very interesting one, Stephen Kinzer. You said, quick, name the rogue state in the Middle East. Hence, it has an active nuclear weapons program, but conducts it in secret. Its security organs regularly kill perceived enemies of the state, both at home and abroad. Its political process has been hijacked by religious fundamentalists who believe they're doing God's will. Its violent recklessness destabilizes the world's most volatile region. It seems as deaf to reason as it is impervious to pressure. Also, its name begins with I. Instead of treating Israel and Iran so differently, the West might try placing them in the same policy basket and seeking equivalent concessions from both. How? The world needs a big security concession from Iran. The world also needs security concessions from Israel. But countries only make security concessions when they feel safe. Therefore, it should be in the interest of the United States and all who want to stabilize that region to try to make those two countries feel safe. How are we going to do that? I really think that with Iran, the possibility does exist for a very new and very different kind of relationship. Uh, what we need to do is approach Iran not simply uh, with the demand, you must negotiate on your nuclear program and, re and achieve certain results that we come into the negotiations demanding. What we should do instead, since that's an obvious non-starter, uh, is to say to Iran what we said to the Chinese. We have a lot of problems and complaints about what you do. We know there are things we do that you don't like. So let's make a list of all these things, and then let's talk about all of them. Then I think in a larger context, uh, we could start to build a very interesting new relationship with Iran that I'd like to see as the core of a new security architecture for that region into which Israel would also be drawn. Once you have a sense in those countries that I'm not about to be bombed and destroyed tomorrow, you open up doors for treating them in ways that would allow both of them in partnership to ratchet down the threats they seem to, per to pose to each other. But as long as a policy from outside powers, including the United States, um, is so clearly anchored in the realities of the past era, of the Cold War, we're never going to be able to do that. We need to break out of this policy quicksand that we're in in Washington, think more creatively. Right now, we're thinking of uh, Iran as kind of the evil empire and Ahmadinejad as the Hollywood central casting image of the new Hitler, and uh, Israel as the uh, heroes of uh, democracy and uh, the plucky little state fighting all those evil enemies in the Middle East. Uh, what we need to do is leave our emotions outside the room. Emotion is always the enemy of wise statecraft. We're so angry at Iran, we can't even see what's good for us in the long run. And I think that applies for the, the whole region. We're so caught up in the emotions that guided our policies in the past, and at our, uh, we're so caught up by our old angers and our old passions, that we're not able to look forward. So I'd like to see us realize that our relationships with Israel and Saudi Arabia were shaped in order to meet the needs of an era that doesn't exist anymore. So it's not about throwing any country off the bus and inviting a new one on. It's about trying to create a new environment, a new atmosphere, uh, a new architecture in that region Stephen in Kinzer. which all the countries would feel they have a stake. We have to leave it there. Thank you very much for being with us, Stephen Kinzer, former New York Times foreign correspondent on his new book, Reset Iran, Turkey, and America's Future. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.